Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The month of March is almost over and the Flames are still outside the playoffs looking in at the second last position in the Scotia North Division. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, I think we have uh, a lot of problems to cure tonight. We're going to try and solve all the world's problems, solve the Flames' problems, get them number one. But before we can talk about how to solve these, we got to talk about what's happened to get them into this hole. Yeah, so we're not going to discuss peace in the Middle East and all that kind of stuff. That's tonight. next week's episode. Oh, okay. Between now and trade deadline, we got time. Okay, good. We got to solve these problems first. Peace in Calgary, then peace in the Middle East, then the trade deadline, then we can find another continent. Okay, good. At least we got the itinerary going. That's right. I got this all planned out. Don't worry. To get into this hole that they were in, they had uh, two short series this week. They played two games against the our rivals up north and then two games against uh, Toronto and let's go back to the game they played last Monday on the 15th here in Calgary against Edmonton Flames did win this one uh, they tied a, a season long three game win streak which is not a great thing when that's your season long win streak this was Daryl Sutter's 110th win with the Flames in his career and after this game Daryl said we looked good in fits and spurts but the Flames ended up with a 4-3 win over our rivals up north thoughts on this game Matt I think that the Flames at times dominated this game and yet let the Oilers have a little bit too much freedom in the offensive zone and it was like you could see elements where the Flames were doing the right things and getting their foot in going in the right direction but there was still those little bad tendencies that this team has had over the past year and a half that started to be more noticeable in this one what what tendencies specifically lack of pace uh, at times um sloppy turnovers uh, allowing better positioning on the oilers part and you know to the oilers credit they they are a talented team that you know they have 116 goals leading the uh, North Division by well, like 10. How many of those so, are not from McDavid or his line? Well, that's the key, though. And you, you know the Flames have to simply be better um, and tighten up on those things, especially when they are playing a team like the Edmonton Oilers. Like if you give this high-end skilled guys time and space they're going to torch you and this game the flames could have let go away if they like if the game frankly had gone on for another period i don't know if the flames win this one this one to me felt like a game of tug of war the flames were sort of on the offense and then they let the oilers tug a little bit and then the flames would tug a little bit and the oilers would tug a bit and the flames would tug a bit and the oilers would tug a bit and it just felt like nobody really established dominance nobody really got good for more than a two three minute uh spurt and then it seemed like both teams kind of lost their game and had to build it back up Mm -hmm. yeah and that that's about where i would view it as well and uh... It's just that Calgary, like in the games against Montreal the last week, the Flames were very much in your face in control in each of those games. And with this one, there was times where that was the case, but it wasn't with any consistency. And again, the Oilers are better than Montreal, but it was noticeable and it was a little bit worrying because oh is like the flames response to daryl coming in going to last like two or three games and then things are going to fall apart again and now it started to be i think the worry for a lot of people after this game just not seeing the same complete game we'd seen uh under daryl sutter 
which I think we could say would lead us to the next game of the week, which was Wednesday where we played the Oilers again. And this time, very different look for the Flames. The Flames ended up getting uh, the big L in this one. 7-3 was the final score in favor of the Oilers. Dry sideline with David each had three points, and Tyson Berry had four assists for Edmonton in this one. Matt, this is the one where I started looking at this going, you know what, the play I saw in this game looked to me like the team we've seen under Jeff Ward and under so many other head coaches before this. It just looked like the Flames stopped doing whatever it was they were supposed to do. They wore their old jerseys. They looked like their old selves when they used to wear those jerseys. Yeah, and... Sorry, their third jerseys, which were they recycled last year's home jerseys. Yes. Um, the Flames in this one, I actually thought they weren't too, too bad to start the game, and... Like, I, I think they pretty much held their own, and the Oilers capitalized twice. The Flames pushed well in the first, but their details weren't there. They were... Yeah, I, I would agree with that. They were pushing, but they weren't they weren't focusing on the details that they needed. Mm-hmm. And then, as the game progressed, like, even when it was 3-1 after 2, you know, like, that's a doable thing. And then the wheels just fell off the wagon entirely. And one thing I one thing I will give the Oilers credit for is I want to give credit to Mike Smith. I think his puck handling abilities, which are you know, it's one of the things we loved about him when he was here. Because of that, the Flames weren't able to establish a forecheck because every time the puck would go into the Oilers' zone with the dump and chase style that Sutter wanted, Smith would put it back out, and we couldn't establish a forecheck. Yeah, and that's where. <laughs> You know, like, when I always look at teams, like, I don't understand why you can't have situational coaching and, like, the players to understand that, oh, they have a goalie that can play the puck really good. Best to not do the dump and chase. Instead, go and do, like, carry it over the line Type well, I place. think you can have situational coaching, but trying to carry it over the lines what got Calgary in the hole they're in. So I think D- Daryl wants to, at least with a new coach, you just want to establish the new routine. And if it's the new routine here but not there, it becomes hard to establish. I know, but it's one of those things that the Flames, a lot of times, like over, well, the last 15 years, frankly, have been too rigid at times to like playing in the system and only playing in the system and not having the ability to adapt on the fly like there are other teams out there that I you know I do watch a lot of other teams and ha- just to see their structures and how they play and like a, a team like Pittsburgh will do things differently based on what feedback they're getting in the game. and But Pittsburgh's also a team that has shown they can play within their system. If I was Calgary's coach, I'd say, show me you can play our system, and then we can go against our system. Yeah, and I can agree with that. It's just, it's frustrating when you're struggling, like the Flames have been thus far this season, to not have that flexibility to maneuver even though you're trying to set a new identity and you know it the game i think largely was lost on the lack of ability to get anything going offensively due to the dump and chase and not being able to get any sustained offensive pressure which then the wheels fell off the wagon in the third period and yeah everything kind of just went (laughs) yeah you could you could see that, I think, even after that. Uh, I'd even say the chase on goal in the third. I think that that's when things fell off. And, yeah, we got too late, but by that point, things were so far gone that, I mean, you could just tell the Flames were really not even in it at that point. Yeah. A- anytime a team goes up by, like, four-plus goals, uh, the losing team, if they score one, two, or three, it's like, oh, good for you. You showed up a bit. Yay. Like, he, like the other team's not really caring or focusing on the details and okay they allowed one oops big deal we're still up by six like, Daryl Sutter claims uh, he doesn't pull his goalies and that's why Markstrom stayed in for this one yet there's plenty of evidence from when he was in LA that 
Quick came out of that net more than a handful of times. Do you think it was the wrong idea to keep Markstrom in? No. Um, this team, the players need to get some accountability for themselves and, you know, frankly, stop playing like crap. And, you know, you can blame, oh, the goalie didn't make all the saves. Well, yeah, you're not helping him be in a position where he can be successful. Like, you're, you're basically pinning your hopes on, oh, well, if Markstrom gets a shutout, maybe we might win this game. Otherwise, we're basically screwed. And, like, the Flames players need to actually get some maturity in their game and realize that, you know, they actually have to play hockey uh, at some point. I can see that, but I can also see that you've got, um, you know, David Riddick, who has looked good in in the games he's played, but he hasn't really spelled off the starter much this season. And I think that it would be good to teach him, a guy who's used to being a starter, how to play from the bench, how to play cold, and just get some some reps in there to get him going. So I, I, I can see both. I wouldn't take uh, Markstrom out because he looked bad, but I'd almost just change the goalie to get Riddick some time. Yeah, I think this is similar to what you were discussing with the the trying to keep the system I think that this is, okay, well, this is going to be one of these type of games. Let this be an instructional period and, you know, place the emphasis on the players and their responsibility instead of scapegoating the goalie. Like, if the Flames were in the system and, like, you know, say Daryl had started from the beginning of the year and everything was more normal, I don't think after the third or fourth goal that uh, Markstrom would have continued on in the net. Uh, I think after the fourth one, for sure, he would have got pulled. But because, you know, the Flames are suffering from a lot of bad habits and just lack of ability, frankly, that um, in order to get themselves to that next level, they need to be reminded and, like, wake up. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's definitely a statement to be made of leaving your goalie in to get shelled, and this is happening because of you guys, so f- go out and figure this out and fix it. Mm-hmm. Well, after that, the Calgary Flames went to Toronto to play the number one team in the North Division, and a uh, very different look for the Maple Leafs in this one, even though it was after St. Paddy's Day. They wore those green St. Pat's jerseys that we see every year. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these. What do you think of the St. Pat's uniforms? Oh, I like it. It's something fun and different. It's a part of their team history. It's a part of Toronto because, you know, the whole Irish, uh, Catholic, and Protestant thing. Like, there is a history of that in the city. And so, like, the St. Patrick's Day thing, it's a thing more in Toronto as an identity of the city than in other places so i can definitely understand it it's sort of like boston in a lot of ways where like the, with the celtics like there, there's just that little bit of extra history there and so it, contextually it makes sense and this one, uh, the captain scored a, a goal in this one. He scored a power play goal his fourth of the year to lift Calgary to the lead, a 4-3 win in this one, and that was their fourth win in five under Sutter. I'll start with some of my thoughts here. I thought that Calgary didn't have a great first period, but still managed to be on top. I thought that Frederick Anderson looked like he was struggling with long shots. Those first two goals, uh, Anderson I don't think looked comfortable with. Um and I was I was questioning Daryl's decision late in this game to put Lucic and Richie on the ice with an empty net. Like that doesn't seem like the guys that you're putting on the ice at that point. Um, I, I don't know. That that was maybe we need to utilize our our players a little bit better. I thought the Leafs started slowly here, um, and and watching Markstrom, you know, play sort of the games that he's played and, and playing again in this one, I'm starting to wonder if he's cooling down a little bit, but. Uh, Matt, what were your thoughts on this one? Well, I think that Anderson has struggled mightily this year. He has. For whatever reason. And I think I don't think that like he's going to fade away as a starter in the NHL. I think this is just a bad a stretch year. of time. Yeah. 
Uh, well, as but, you and I have said, there's going to be two new starter positions next year, so I think Anderson, just like Riddick, will find a home. Yeah, and I think that Toronto will still keep him if they can. Um, like, I don't... Because especially with Toronto's system, like, they don't really have any good young up They got some goalies. cap issues, though. True. It, yeah. It, yeah, I could see that, then. That's the only um, reason I think they get, might get rid of him, is I think that's the easy way to clear some cash. But we're not here to talk about the Leafs. Yeah, no, and uh, I think that the Flames largely were benefiting from a rather Hiller-esque in his final season with the Flames type performance from Anderson. And, uh, you know, like all the long shots, like Tanev shot and Giordano shot, just got through and like realistically if the goalie was playing adequately I don't think either one of those goes in and with the rest of the Flames effort in this game I think that like the last time that they were in Toronto they kind of skated away with a sneaky win due to good goaltending and I think that the Flames at times uh, Markstrom was the, the, with the second goal and the third goal, they're kind of debatable. But, uh, you know, like, he could have possibly. But after that third one, uh, he really did step it up and shut the door. And I think that, frankly, the Flames stole the two points due to Markstrom's play. You know what, though? And we talked about that a lot early this season. When you're paying a guy as much as you're paying Markstrom, you've got to have him be able to steal you some games, right? And this was one Oh, of for sure. Flames didn't have a great beginning. Markstrom didn't start well, but Markstrom was able to focus and I think, like you said, looked great late when they needed him. And, yeah, they, they got this win because of the goalie. I think the story of this, I think, was that one goalie looked good and one goalie did not. Yeah, and I think that, frankly, Calgary just... The 18 skaters, I think, played a very subpar game. And, like, frankly, looking at the Flames' top four forwards with Lindholm, Kachuk, Monahan, and Gaudreau, it's like, uh, by and large, you guys are playing like AHLers. You know, and, like, yeah, Kachuk scored in this one, but the entirety of their games like they have been bad and let's, do, let's come back to this thought because we'll talk a little bit more about this once we're done with the week if that's okay yes um so the flames sneak the win out in that one as we said probably not the win that uh th- not maybe the win that they deserve but they got a win and you'll take the two points so you can get them then we move into hockey night in canada again in toronto um and this one we had uh, the Maple Leafs with a two nothing lead over Calgary on uh, on Saturday night, and I, I think uh, to me it was just more of the same, more subpar play from this team. But what was your thought, Matt? Well, frankly, uh, like I don't even feel that the Flames had any scoring chances at all in this game, uh, or sustained pressure. Like it, like yeah, they got a handful of shots on net, but. Like, I think that this may have been the easiest shutout in recent memory for any goaltender. Like, I, I don't think that Campbell was even remotely tested. Uh, it, frankly, it was barely a warm-up for him. Like, I think that he had more of a hard time during the pregame skate. Calgary looked like they didn't want to be in this one. Like, they just... Yeah. Like, I, don't, uh, I don't know what the issue was, but they just looked like they stopped. They didn't come into this one looking like they care. No, like uh, uh, it was as ambivalent I've seen a team play that I can even recall. Like it was just a like a no effort, no concern, no consideration, no anything, no intensity. Okay, that that happened. And I was trying to figure out why, and you can't blame it on a long road trip. I mean, they've only been on the road for two games. Like I just, I don't know why such a, a dip in motivation for this one i know like yeah it was the third game in four nights but, but that's the like, way it, this whole it, season's it, been like but like if you're having conditioning issues where after like three games in four nights 
like if you're playing like this, then you guys need to go and hit the gym, uh, because um, you know, like it's like it, this is ridiculous. Like, uh, like I don't even understand. Like the, the frankly, like Daryl Sutter was brought in to this team to sort out like where the problems are and fix the team and it seems that like even more of the players are not tr trying at all and it's like you know and well frankly, this this was less less effort than even we've seen from these guys earlier right like we've talked yeah. about the lack of effort but this was to a new low for Calgary yeah and you know, like, if this kind of game continues and persists... Like, you know, you can excuse one. And, okay, sure, that happened. But, like, if this happens again, then, frankly, you know, I'm beginning to take the view as that it might be better for the Flames to dismantle significant parts of this team and Start go into a mini big rebuild. Moves coming up, trade deadline. Yeah, like and like go on a more systemic retool and like make the guys that actually seem to care on a consistent basis the guys you kind of build around for a bit suck for a couple years and go ahead and like that's not the ideal in any way shape or form but you know it, it gets to a point where like if you people are not wanting to play hockey then why are you here and, and you said you can excuse one of them but i think they put in a lousy effort against edmonton i think they put in a you know a not great effort on friday like i i don't think this is the first time that we've seen a lousy effort for the team i think their pass for not playing hard is is used up at this point yeah and it you know like you look at like buffalo and what they're going through and like just the lack of caring at all by the Sabres players you're seeing you know like I think they've lost 13 or 14 in a row now and it's getting to the point where like it's frustrating because like the these players if they're actually going and pulling in the right direction you can even see it when they're actually trying to come back late in games where they just pour it on and on and on and on. But for whatever reason, this team just can't seem to find that gear at all. And, like, I, I'm at a loss for... Like, you know, I know that Daryl's an excellent motivator and is already beginning to do his work of trying to light fires under these guys. But, you know, it's... Matt, we'll come back to that fires idea. Let's just wrap up this week, and then we can talk about all the player problems because yeah. we got that on our agenda. But let's get through this week, and then we can discuss the task at hand. Yeah. Um, so right now we have the Flames sitting in the sixth of seven spots in the Scotia North Division. We have Calgary sitting at 33 points, 10 points up from Ottawa. The teams above us, Vancouver has 35 points, Montreal has 37 points, Winnipeg has 38 points. So the three, four, and five teams are only within a couple points of us, but we're going to need to start putting points up quickly. I mean, sixth place seems like a far ways out, but we're, what, five points out from fourth? But, you know, it, it, it's tough because we're starting to get to the point where playoffs are not going to be in our hands. It's going to be in somebody else's hands, and you never want to be in that spot. Yeah, and you, you look at teams, uh, like, every game from here on out, and as it has been all season, is a four-point game. Someone has to win, someone has to lose. And the ideal situation uh, for the Flames is for, like, say, Vancouver to beat Edmonton, Edmonton to beat Montreal, and Montreal to beat Vancouver, where everybody gets two points, but you know like nobody's breaking away and if they're all kind of just staying in that mediocre zone if the flames can actually get their stuff together like it, it's not even a big hill for them to climb it's not like that they're they're at like where ottawa is and like they have to win out but the anything. issue is they're losing the games against the teams that are right ahead of us and giving those teams two points yeah well like if they had say uh 
beat the Oilers and Can- uh, the Leafs this week this in the second games of that with or even one of them like that then they're only two points out of a playoff spot or tied with Montreal and like basically problems are solved and you're ready to go but like this team desperately needs a two or three or four game winning streak just to erase more of that problem and it's doable it's just that this team it can't seem to get any consistency in their effort i was about to say it's doable if they can be consistent but if you're winning one losing one winning two losing two you're gonna stay probably where you deserve which is outside that playoff spot and and you know i'm and you sort of mentioned it earlier matt still staying on sort of the idea of where the flames are sitting in the standings um if they can make it to the playoffs, are you confident they can put four wins together? Well, the way I look at it is if they actually get themselves to the playoffs from where they are now, they'll have sorted themselves out enough where they should be able to beat the first round opponent and probably give the second round opponent a hard time possibly getting through that. It's just, can they get their stuff together and enough on the right page? Because, like, back when Daryl took over the Kings that first uh, time that they went to the Cup and won the Cup, like, they were similarly a very disjointed bunch in very much an identical manner that the Flames were. And, like, they had a lot of parts that were good, It's just that there was no actual cohesive direction, and I think that, like, Sutter only had, I think, like, 35 games to uh, get the Kings going and into the playoffs, and then they went all the way. Like, if the Flames can sort out their stuff and learn the lessons and Sutter can motivate the players and get them on the right page then the Flames have just as much chance of winning the Cup as they would have had none of these problems been here all season. It's just, can Daryl get them through to them to get them on the right page? Because you look at certain players, like, frankly, Monaghan, Gaudreau, and Kachuk specifically for large parts of the last month and a half, two months, have looked like AHL players. And, you know, like, frankly, at times, like, if the Flames had replaced them with guys in Stockton, I think that they would have been better off. That's how bad those three have been. Well, I think this is what we're seeing, right? And you and I have talked about this. Is is this a coaching issue or is this an issue with the 18 guys on the ice? And I still don't think that it's a coaching issue. And I think we're seeing that now, even under Daryl, the issues with the guys on the ice. And it was very telling in the media availability that Johnny and Monty did. Um... As we know, I mean, Daryl's trying to run more of a dump and chase system, and Goudreau's struggling. And even before, you know, like you said, it's been for longer than Daryl's been here. But, um, and I'm not quoting him exactly, but Johnny pretty much said, whether I'm comfortable with it or not, I need to adapt. And I think those guys are very used to playing one way. And as we've had different coaches, Jeff Ward, now Daryl Sutter, I just don't think they want to adapt. I think they're used to being the top guy, they're used to being the top dog and doing things their way. Yeah, and that that's a okay if you're actually doing your job. And frankly, you know, like when Gaudreau is flying around the ice and doing Johnny Gaudreau things, uh, there's no complaints from anyone because you know, like when he's ninety nine point guy, it, you, nobody's complaining. But how do we about. keep him doing that? And that that's where. Uh, Daryl has to be able to get through to him that, like, okay, if you're not being Mr. 99 point guy, you have to play responsibly on the ice and not be a turnover machine and completely ineffective. And at, you know, like, I think it was a couple games ago that in the final minute against the Oilers, or minutes against the Oilers when the net was empty, Gaudreau's line was out there for a defensive zone faceoff against McDavid's line and you know like risky for sure but those guys need to learn how to play a complete 
200 foot game and I think that they've gotten by because the skill is there and you know you can forgive you know, oh he didn't back check well he did score two goals and had an assist so who cares but you can now cover up the holes in your game yeah but now it's getting to the point where you're not as effective offensively and you're bad frankly defensively like frankly like if you have a like a normal season like a 60 point guy in a normal season who does play that 200 foot game it's far more valuable than whatever Kachuk Monahan or Gaudreau are bringing at this point and like it, it, if you say took airlifted Mike Hoffman into the team just as a random like he's about that kind of a guy that would improve the team it, even if you just swap one for one like that's how mediocre these guys are playing right now and the frustrating part is they have it in them to actually be successful because at times they have shown that they can it, it, I just, I do not understand why, like, all of a sudden, uh, like, the lack of motivation in giving anything on the ice, like, I, I just don't, don't, like, even just from, like, their own career standpoint, like, you look at Patrick Laine, for example, like, he's kind of a tarnished player now, just because he kind of dogged it until he got traded. And now, like, there's always going to be that lingering, uh, is he actually committed to playing hockey? And, I like, that'll follow him for his career. And, like, with Monahan, Gaudreau, and Kachuk, like, they're starting to get that, you know, like, what's wrong with you people? I've asked for a number of years on this show, and, I mean, you've heard me even ask you outside of this, do you think maybe we put too much... Because they were the best guys we had that we put too much stock in them. I mean, I've asked you, is Monaghan really a number two center? You know, and I think now we're even seeing Johnny as our number two left wing. Like, you can't rely on guys that are inconsistent to be your top guys. I wonder if these guys are just sort of... Re- and, yeah, you're right, they haven't looked good, but I wonder if they're regressing to where they are, which is second-line guys, and we're just realizing that, for whatever reason, they're not the right second-line guys to be here. Yeah, and I think we've done everything we can to motivate him. At some point, I have to say it's not working out. It's like a relationship, right? You're a nice person. You're just not the right person for me. Yeah, and I think that like if like over the last month and a half of the season, like if Sutter can't get them on the right page, then I think yeah, you have to walk away from guys like Gaudreau and Monahan, and I potentially think this is the even whole reason. I think there's the whole reason Daryl was brought in is to figure out who can we motivate to work hard and who just doesn't want to work hard. And let's get rid of those guys that don't want to work hard. There's homes for them, but yeah. this is not the home for them. And I think it's one of these things of if you're not going to work for Daryl, we don't want you here. And, yeah. and you, I mean, we've talked about trading Goudreau and trading Monahan, And, you know, I think that this is really that time to figure out who can put up and who has to pack up and leave. Yeah, well, you know, like, if it was me and, like, I was Daryl, I'd have pictures of him winning the Stanley Cup both times in L.A. and have big posters made and put permanently in the dressing room. And saying, if, if, if you're, you know, like, I know how to get this, you know, and if you don't want to listen to me, that's fine. Go somewhere else. See, this is why this is why I'm not the head coach because I do the immature thing and I take his two rings and when Johnny's complaining, I stick him on my ears and say, "I'm sorry, I can't hear you. My ears are plugged with Stanley Cup rings." Yeah, <laughs> pull the old Patrick Wah. <laughs> sorry, I can't hear you. The diamonds are in my ears. I just the sound's uh, not coming through. Yeah, I I don't know what it is. I just it, uh, it's a, like a magic mute button. <laughs> Maybe one day when you've got two rings, you won't have to listen to anybody either. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's why I'm not head coach of this team. Not because I don't no. have two rings sticking my ears, because I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, I think I pretty much would too. Like you know, because like, especially like this team, even though like they they've been around for a while, they're still a very young and immature team, and yep. like that that's one of the 
problems that I find that, like, this team never really got a bunch of good quality veteran players. Well, we tried. I except mean, we tried for Milan Neil. Lucic. Uh, yeah, we tried Neil in that role. We tried Brower in that role. Like, we've tried to bring in that role. Yeah, but, like, Lucic, I think, is the best example thus far. I agree. But, you know, like, don't see, like, the normal response that, you know, like, if you, like, look back at, like, Chicago or Boston or whatever, like, the, they fed off of the veteran guys that they brought in and were able to take those lessons and apply them and then take the next step and apply them and take the next step. And, like, we're just not seeing... You know, it's more like, oh, you can't tell me what to do, and the kid runs to their room and slams the door. And it's like, um, okay. And this is why I think it's... You know. And you and I talked about this when Daryl came in, right? It's put up or shut up time now. I mean, this core yeah. is not going to last long um, before we got to start re-signing guys. We can't afford this whole core again. So I think, no. as you said, it's, you know, if you're not doing well, let's figure out who's not and let's move those guys. And if that means wholesale change for this uh, lineup at the deadline or the draft, so be it. Yeah, like, honestly, like... You know, if the the players aren't working out, you know, like, the, the Flames have a good young defense group. That's great. And I have no complaints about any of the defensemen. They're doing their job. They're great, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Like, for where they're at in their careers, all of them are doing awesome. They need to take it more, get better. But, you know, they're still young. Like, this is Anderson's first time as a top four defenseman. You know, he's learning. Hannafin's taking the next step. Valimaki is looking like an NHL player. Shillington, when he's been playing, has looked better than he has. So, like, you know... The goaltending's figured out. Yeah. If the forward group is going to be this, you know, I either trade them for equivalent guys or prospect it up and, you know, let guys like Phillips, like uh, Peltier, like Zari and just filter them up and you know it, it'll suck for a year or two but oh well uh, you know like at the end of the day I'd rather this team regress for a bit sort their stuff out and come back and like make the, the guys like Dubé and Manjapane and Lindholm like your core group and go forward than this perpetual mediocrity frankly and and every time i talk about johnny i get a lot of people who call us or write to us on twitter or email us and say well why would you want to get rid of them the flames are going to suck you can still get good players even though it's a down season for johnny and money and i think right now like you said you, do, you can't trade all 12 forwards you're not going to move no. them all but if you were to move johnny for an equivalent on the right side now you've got kachuk who we'll talk about in a little bit Lindholm and whoever we get for Johnny on the right, then you can move, like you were saying, sort of Manjapani, Dubé, maybe Monaghan or Backlund on your second line. Like, you can use those pieces to fill the holes you have. And you're not going to dump Johnny. This isn't going to be a Jerome McGinley deal where you're moving for two prospects we have no idea who they are. Like, you're, if you do this right, because Johnny's still in his prime, you're going to get something that can improve this team. This isn't just a sell-off for cheap. Yeah, and, like, even if... You look at, like, um, the the trades that come to mind are, like, the uh, Matt Duchesne trade, where, you know, like, even though, like, the Avalanche did sell them off for a bunch of prospects, they got a bunch of good quality assets out of that. And, like, even if they don't go for, like, a replacement NHL talent and decide to just prospect it up, like they'll get. I, I don't uh, think. I, I think we have enough forward prospects now. It's not the time to trade for prospects. No, I think you I, have to I know. move for NHL roster players. I agree, but like even if they went that route, they would still be getting quite a good group back. Like I, you know, like I don't think that there's really like if they can't get their stuff together and they have to go this route, like they're going to get value out of it and. You know, we'll see exactly how the fits will be, but 
you know, it, uh, if it get, comes to that, like, it's almost addition by subtraction, like the James Neal trade, where just getting rid of the malcontent in the, the room, deleting that off the roster makes the team better just by them not being there. And if that's the case, you know, like, it would suck badly, because, you know, like, as fans, everybody likes Goudreau, like, but you see jerseys that this But you'll and that like and the guy that you get for him, because he'll be exactly. equivalent talent. Exactly. It's not and like you're trading in your Jerome McGinley journey for a jersey for a Kenny Agostino jersey. You'll get an equivalently good player. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it creates more opportunities for other guys to step up, whether it's one of the kids on the farm or whatever. And, you know, it, it there it is no real bad alternative with this. It's just that you would like this team to figure their things you try out to move, right now. Do you try to move 23 as well? Yeah. Uh, frankly, like, even with how Kachuk has fallen off the face of the earth, like, before I would have considered him untouchable, but, you know, it's... Like... He he is showing a stunning lack of maturity as a player. Like yeah, the whole team had or whomever in that uh, players only meeting had that conversation with him. But you know, with Daryl coming aboard, you know, like it's a sign from the management that hey, you know, we believe in you, Kachuk, that you're supposed to be. You know, like, you're the key guy on this team. And uh, his lack of maturity and bounce back, frankly, because I think he's played even worse under Daryl than he was previously. And unless It makes me wonder if he's hurt. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, unless he's battling an injury, then it's like, what's going on? Because, like, he shouldn't be this bad. And, like, he's... Not just bad offensively, but like it's like he's not effective in the pest mode or like basically any mode. Like it's just it, it, uh, the ghost of Matthew Kachuk. It's not even a close facsimile. But I mean, you were talking about his maturity, and to give him credit, he's 23, right? I mean, he's still oh, a yeah. young player. And I think that there's been stuff that's happened this year where he hasn't, you know, he got asked to change his game and by his teammates. And I think, you know, I think that this, and everyone has a down year. And I think either he's hurt or he's just came in with the wrong mindset and he's not having a good year. But I don't look at him as being tradable because of that. I think his body of work, you got to look at a guy's whole body of work. And I think his body of work is a flame to me, says, give him a chance to bounce back from this. Yeah, well, it's one of those things that... With how, like, the Flames got into this spot was by being a little too... Like, that's okay. You know, and I think that... You know, Kachuk should be the leader on this team. Like, frankly, he should be the next captain of this team. And he needs to take those emotional steps to get himself there. And, you know, the, he's just not responding in the manner that he needs to to take himself to that next level. And, you know, because frankly, he is the Flames franchise player. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point. And but it's not like he's the only guy who's struggling this year, Matt. The whole team's no, struggling. I know. And how would you say, like, when the Flames used to struggle, like, in the dark times, <laughs> um, it was frequently Jerome McGinley who put the team on his back and carried them. And, you know, like, frankly, Kachuk should be that guy for this team. And... You know, like, yeah, the Flames are going wayward, but, uh, like, it, instead of him elevating his game, his game's regressing just as much as everybody else's. And, like, it, you're looking at this team, and it, it seems like the only guys that are consistently playing well are Milan Lucic, uh, Michael Backlund, and Derek Ryan, and everybody else's game has fallen off quite a bit. And it's... 
just perplexing and you know you well, want like you're somebody saying you to might s- move them so do you say that because you've had a bad half season it's time to go or do you give them time to try and work out of this even if it takes the next season or do you um, say well how you should you, have the no. you're 23 you should have the team in your back you don't out you go well no it's more of you know instead of being completely untouchable you actually pick up the phone and listen if a deal makes sense Whereas before it'd be like, oh, you want Kachuk and click, <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those where, you know, you listen at least a, instead of like an automatic no. And like uh, that, he needs to be better. And like, no, you don't just throw him out because, you know, with everybody else because, oh, well, we're just going to tear down. It, it's he needs to be better and like this kind of stuff should not be acceptable at any point and like none of this garbage that we've seen this team go through should be acceptable and like we need the players to actually feel like that and get mad and get mad at each other like this is and we don't know they're not we're not in the room true but like the like even just the camera panning on the bench, you're not seeing anybody being upset with this, and we don't know what's going on in the room. And I, yeah. I can't I can't believe that nobody is getting getting mad again. We don't know. We don't have that information. But I just think that yeah, he's not having a good season. Maybe he's hurt. And maybe he's not. We can't say that he is or isn't. But I think you need to see and. You said some key at the beginning of this. He's the next captain. He's only 23. He's got some time to learn how to do that. And maybe there's a season mm. where he has to learn how to bounce back and how to take that team and how to work on our new coach. And I, you can't expect, well, just because he's the best guy that he's, you know, leader in material, how often have we criticized Edmonton or other teams for putting their young stars as captain? I think this is part of his learning process. And I think you've still got to look at him as untouchable and say, well, let's see what he does next season. Yeah. I, I'm not arguing it. It's just that, like, frankly, like this whole forward group, you know, it's getting to the point where jettison them all, and you know, like if it, and start over. Like it, it's well, and, and you know as well as I do. You probably worked in a work environment where you have. Um you know, a bad colleague and the colleague brings everybody down. Again, we're not in the room and I don't want to speculate about what is or isn't going on in that room because we're not there. But for all we know, it's just a bummer place to be right now. And, you know, Matthew's trying, but I mean, again, we don't, we don't know what that looks like. Right. So I think we've just got to wait and move out the pieces we can see aren't doing their best. And I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Matthew came up with a big fight last week. I think he's doing what he can, but I think there's an injury. Yeah. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. Yeah. And and even if yeah. not, I think he's still a valuable guy, but maybe he's not your 1L. Yeah. It, it's, you know, like that's why Daryl's been brought in. You know, we get to sort out all of the stuff and let the pieces fall where they may. And, like, at this point, it's just a lot of frustration because... Like, frankly, like, this team, if they're pulling in the right direction and together as an actual team, they are as good as anybody. And, like, that's, for me, that's the frustrating part about this, is, like, if you guys are actually just working together and as a team, it's something like Daryl said, that, like, he, these guys need to be more like soldiers and, like, do their job and you know learn how to actually do that and work with each other and i i think that like for whatever reason like everybody completely got off the same page and like even old chemistries aren't working like they should and it's and we're i think there's i think there's a lot of things going on there and again i don't want to speculate because i'm not there i think it's we're being asked to play differently we don't want to play differently or we're too stubborn to do that. I think these guys are probably in their own heads too, trying to work hard and make it to the playoffs or just saying, you know what, we're out. Screw it. It's a, you know, it's a weird season. Like I think honestly, at this point, I look at that. If we make the playoffs, great, but I'm kind of saying this is not the flames year. Yeah. And you know, it's sort of like the 15, 16 season where, 
you know, like after making the playoffs in the second round, it like everybody, all the Flames fans were disappointed that oh, the the Flames were bad. But you know, on the other hand, they got Matthew Kachuk, and like this year's draft, there are plenty of good players. And if the Flames miss the playoffs, the top ten is loaded with decent guys. This is an above average draft crop. There, there are good players available. So like. At worst, like, if everything screws up, the Flames are going to add a really good player to the organization. So, on the bright side, there is a bright side. Like, it's not like the Flames are in the Sharks territory last year where, oh, we don't even have our first, even though we were the, one of the worst teams in the league. And I'm so, not even looking at the draft. I'm just looking at... Sometimes when you make the playoffs, you go too far, it... It lets you cover up the issues, right? Oh, well, as bad as we were, we made it to the, the conference finals. We made it to round two. We can't be that bad. We made it to round two. And I think maybe this team needs the kick in the butt to say, guys, we we're so bad we didn't make it. Now it's evident change needs to be made. Yeah, and that... I mean, even the year the Blues went from the bottom of the cup, you would not say that was the best team in the league. I think oh, no. that that covered up some of the issues with the roster. Yeah, and like you look at... Um... Like, last year, the Flames, like, they beat Winnipeg, which, frankly, with all the injuries, like, that was kind of a given. And then, you know, they pushed Dallas, and they probably should have won that series. But then Dallas figured out their game and went all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals, and I think that might have given the Flames a little bit more of an ego boost of, well, we were better than Dallas in that series. And they went all the way, so, like, we don't have to do much, and we should be able to go to the finals. And I think that, like, the Flames, just from an outside observer, seem to be overconfident in themselves and not willing to put the work in to get there. And, like, the, they are supremely talented, but they're not working hard to actually apply it properly, and that's where, like, the disconnect is. I agree. And I just, like I said, I think the best thing we might be able to do is not make the playoffs. And I would say not even not make the playoffs. This might sound bad as a sort of Flames supporter. I think the best thing we can do is be so out of it by the deadline that we, that we sell. I think one of yeah. the worst things we could do is not sell pieces that we might be able to get top value for because we're two, three, four points in the playoffs. I think we either need to be in this or out of this. Yeah, a, a clear delineation. And I think that, frankly, if the Flames are on the borderline and, say, like, a point or two out or a point or two in, I think that the Flames should sell anyway and just They won't, let it though. Rip. Knowing Tree, they won't. Yeah, and, well, they should is what I'm, you know. I, I don't disagree, but and I think that there's players like Johnny that if you wait till the off season, and somebody has a chance to look and go, oh, yeah, he had a bad year. I'm not going to give you as much. I think you could, I don't want to say fleece a team, but I think your value for a guy like Johnny or Monty goes up at the deadline if you're willing to part with them then. Yeah, I agree. And especially with the weird season that it is that, you know, like, there are teams that are going to want to overpay. Like, even in our own division, like, you look at, like, a Toronto or whomever. I think Winnipeg would be a good trade partner there. Yeah, like, you look at some of the teams, like Montreal, where, like, they have a bunch of good young players, or Ottawa, even, who could use, like, Monaghan or... But Goodrow. Ottawa doesn't make a trade for your top guy when true, they're way out of true, this. True, true. I think, Matt, if you're going to do this, you either, and I've been thinking about this, you have to trade it to Toronto or Montreal knowing you won't see those guys again. If we make yeah. the trade with Edmonton, Winnipeg, or Vancouver, Johnny and Monty could come back to haunt you. If you make the deal with Toronto or Montreal, they become somebody else's issue and you see them twice a year. Yeah, I agree. Right? Like, if you're going to do the interdivision trade, it's got to be Toronto, Montreal, or Ottawa, but it's not going to be Ottawa, so it's got to be Toronto or Montreal. Yeah. I agree, and you know we'll see um, on both counts. Like uh, again, we're still in this weird phase where not enough information. <laughs> um, 
one of our, our Twitter listen, Twitter readers and followers who often writes in at 76 once and asked, um, who in your eyes has not adjusted to Sutter's play? And I think we've talked about a few of them. When I look at this roster, I can't really name anyone who has really looked better under Sutter that didn't before. I would say for me, the entire roster hasn't adjusted well to Daryl. I mean, we see flashes of it, but I can't look at one guy and say, wow, he's doing a lot better now. Uh, I actually do have one guy, and that's who, Milan Lucic. Who is looking better? Yeah. Uh, he, he was looking good before, but I think he's looking even better now. But he had a lousy start, and I think it was just him coming around. I don't know if it has anything to do with Daryl or if it's just he's coming around. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Yeah, um, well, it's one of those things that... Um, he knows Frank- Daryl. He knows what's expected out of Daryl. Yeah, and I think frankly, like it it fits his way of playing like a glove. So it, I think that's more the way that Lucic is comfortable playing is under a Daryl Sutter type system. So I think it's just a uh, one that you know. And frankly, with how Lucic has played this season, to me, he's played more like a three and a half, four million dollar player. So, like, he's actually been rather valuable just on his on-ice play, let alone all the good stuff off the ice, so... Is there anybody else that we haven't talked about who you look at who's just, let's say, fallen apart or regressed under Daryl Sutter who's just not getting this, besides the guys we've already talked about? Well, frankly, like, up front, only the three veteran guys, Backlund, uh, Lucic, and Ryan, have looked good or on par with where they were. And on the blue line, basically Tanev, Hannafin, and Anderson have looked as good or better. Um, everybody else ha- has been either slightly below where they were or worse. And Even Backlund, though, like the dump and chase entry is his cup of tea. It's not a new Daryl thing. I mean, that's what he's most comfortable doing. Yeah, and... Well, especially like the the three older guys, like they're they've been in the league a while, and mm. like they've played under a whole bunch of different manners of playing. So like they're used to, oh, okay, we're going to do it this way. Okay, cool. And like there's no learning or uptake. It's like, oh, okay, that's what and you're they, wanting. And I, Good. That's an interesting point too. I think some of those older guys, not only are they older, they've been around, right? Johnny, Monty, they've only ever been here. They don't maybe know that struggle of going to a new team adapting to a new system learning a new coach yeah because like you look at um backland like he made his debut in like 2009 mm. uh, like that was under brent and so brent sutter um hartley like he's been under a bunch of different systems and that's good it's um but I think not only is, has Michael Backlund been under a bunch of different systems, he's been asked to play different ways. I mean, I think yeah. from where he was drafted and what he was expected when he came in his rookie year to what we see now, he's been asked to play in different ways. He hasn't looked good under some of those coaches, but he's eventually found his identity. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the... Like, that's part of the problem with this team is that, like, yeah, like, say Gaudreau, he's been here for, like, this is his sixth season here, but he's still a very immature player. Mm-hmm. And same with Monaghan. Uh, like, these guys, like, they, they're they used to just playing their way, and, like, it's like nobody actually taught them how to play a 200-foot game or do the things that are necessary or that those things are even expected of you and uh, when we I had think- the, when we when we talked to theo flurry for the show if you remember he told us the biggest changes guys have to make when they come to the nhl from juniors in junior your job is wait around for the puck somebody will get you the puck and you go score when you're in the nhl you have to learn how to play without the puck because in yeah. junior as soon as you don't have the puck you get off and we'll put somebody else on to get the puck back and then we've got it we'll put you on to go score and mm-hmm. i think that's the part that these guys haven't um yeah haven't fully and, figured out and you see like guys from nhl history like steve eiserman was a good example of that he was bad 
defensively. Like the they were the Red Wings were wanting to trade him one for one for Alexei Yashin at one point because he was so bad defensively. But Scotty Bowman actually taught him how to play that proper 200 foot game, and now he's like revered as one of the best leaders in NHL history because oh okay that's what it actually takes to win. And he didn't get that feedback. From his early coaches all the way through until Scotty Bowman, and like I think that like the Flames just haven't had a proper teacher coach uh, to work with guys to say, hey, this is like in order to actually win a Stanley Cup, this is what you have to actually do. And well, or and and as I said earlier in this show, I think even realizing that hey, this guy just can't be worked with. He's not a two hundred foot player, so let's put him into a roster that has those guys to augment him. Right, and and I think that we've looked at those guys, our top guys, and we haven't brought in the two hundred foot players to augment them. Yeah, exactly, and and, and like, that's yeah, like. It, like how would you say like if the flames had more guys like Derek ryan throughout their lineup they would be better off it's just that you know they don't have that and got some of the younger guys like sam bennett haven't learned you know like he's still chasing the oh i'm an offensive player and not learning how to be that good shutdown center winger guy and a bunch of the other guys haven't learned how to be that good 200 foot player even like you know at, like even guys like Dubé and Majapane are still very much an all offense no defense type player and like those guys too like all of everybody basically needs to learn how to be effective all over the ice and it it comes or not at, and play them yeah. in that in an appropriate position yeah, like you can have a Phil Kessel on your team and be successful, but you I have think... to have him in his way, not you know relying on him to do more than what Phil Kessel is. Well, and Phil Kessel was put on the lines where it was Phil and two guys. Like I think part of the issue there is we've got Johnny and Monty together on mm-hmm. the same line, and they're both playing that way. Um, the thing to remember, and I was just looking it up here, is starting next year, um, which Goudreau's final year, he has a five-team trade list. So I think if you are going to make that deal, you're best to make it this year when you've got a lot more option to trade him. Yeah, I agree. And frankly, like I think that uh, with Goudreau and Monaghan, it, it almost it seems like the Flames might need to actually go back and dial back the clock a bit and throw Lindholm back on that line. Uh, just because I think that uh, Lindholm is a very good 200-foot player. And he's one of the few other players that actually does play responsibly all over the ice. And just that dynamic, I think, might be what's needed for that line. Because Kachuk also seems to be missing Michael Backlund a lot. And I think... and I wouldn't, I wouldn't put Lindholm back on that line. I think we've tried it, and it's not good for Lindy. I don't think you're going to get more out of that line because Lindholm's there. I think you need to move guys around to find new line mates for Lindholm so you know if you've got them internally or if you got to go get them. True. I don't think that putting Lindholm on that line increases our odds of making the playoffs. We've tried it. It didn't really work. I think you got to shuffle guys around. Maybe it's Backlund you put with, uh, you know, with um, Kachuk and Lindholm. Maybe it's... Dubé and, and, you know, Manjapani. Like, I think you've got to move on and say Lindholm is one of the core guys. Let's do what's best for him long term. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. And uh, it, it, this whole next bit, uh, I think the Flames should be open to more experimentation overall and see if they can get things to work better because. It, it's they just are not on the same page at all and they need to stumble into some chemistry and i was gonna spend some time talking about the power play but i think this is just all you know systemic of the flames players need to either want this or ship out of town yeah pretty much like it, it's we, we, you, ca- you can't make somebody want something. You've either got to be motivated or you're not. Daryl can't come out here and make you motivated or make you play differently than you want to. If the yeah. guy is not motivated, 
There's not much you can do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, you know, have... and it, it, you know, it, it's like trying to get anybody to do something that they don't want to do. If it's not in them, it just simply isn't. And no, no matter what prodding you can do, like if you're just basically in it for the paycheck, that's great, awesome, good for you for earning it. It's just that we also don't need you here because we're actually focused on winning. Uh, we had one last question here again from 76 Swanson on Twitter, and this is one I don't know we're going to be able to answer, but he says, what's the math for the Flames to get in the playoffs? If they are trying to catch Montreal, what would Montreal's record need to be for the Flames to get in? Matt, I sat trying to do this math for 20 minutes, and to me this comes down to more than just they need a certain record and we need a certain record. Vancouver's in there. It's To me, that we're still at a point where we're so far out, there's a lot of variables that go into this. Yeah, it, it's I mean, we can tell you what Montreal's record needs to be, but if Calgary's not winning, the whole thing's moot. Yeah, it's... I think the easiest way to say this is the Flames need to win some hockey games, and a good portion of them over the next little stretch to erase the deficit that they've built themselves. Like, they play four games this week, two against Ottawa, two against Winnipeg. They need at least six points at least and nothing less than that is acceptable and i think for the next handful of weeks they need to be getting three out of four points every time you need to pretty much be winning four out of seven here on out not just winning but if you look at the records of the teams that are in the playoffs their goal differentials are all positive like you know in our division everyone that's in has a positive goal differential honda west everyone but st louis does and st louis only minus three boston's division in manual life east everyone does discover central almost everyone does except for columbus like you've you've got to be winning but you've also got to be just scoring more goals than you're letting in and i think they just need to play hockey and and play winning hockey yeah, and, like, you look at, like, how bad this team has been, and, frankly, like, they're fourth in the the division in goals surrendered. And, like, that, considering how many times they've been blown out and, like, all the ridiculousness of this team, like, they're still a, one of the better overall defensive teams in terms of, preventing goals like especially like if we were playing it with any cohesion we'd probably have surrendered 10 or 15 less goals like the blowouts wouldn't have happened basically and uh you're looking at like if the flames can start generating that offense or any offense really like we're tied with ottawa for fewest goals you know, and, like, there are very few teams around the NHL that have fewer. Like, there's only uh, six teams that have... Seven teams that have fewer goals than the Flames. Like, that's bad. And, like, that's just not sustainable if the Flames want to actually make the playoffs. Like, you need to actually be scoring. And... I think if we're looking at this as what does Montreal need to do to get us in, I think that we're, I mean, we shouldn't be in at that point, right? I think we have to look at what does Calgary have to do to get themselves in, not what is how many games does Montreal have to lose for Calgary to get in. Yeah. And, like, you look at Montreal, and, like, they've lost nine games in overtime. Like, if they, they had the same amount of overtime losses as Calgary, Winnipeg, or... Uh, Calgary, Vancouver, or Ottawa, who have the most... Calgary, well, Vancouver, and Ottawa have three. Yeah. Like, we'd be two points up on Montreal right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Montreal would be right down with Ottawa near the bottom. And that's just the overtime loser points. Like, it, Calgary has one more win than Ottawa, uh, Montreal. So, like, it, it's doable. Like, it, it with this division... Like, one of the reasons why, like, I'm so viscerally frustrated with this team is the fact that all seven of the these teams suck badly. And, like, if you're playing even remotely okay, you should be walking away with this division 
handily. No problem. Like, if this team was playing like they were last year even, I think the Flames have close to 50 points. Just because everybody else has so many problems that you could just walk over everybody. But this team seems to be just beating themselves and getting in their own way in new and creative, adventurous ways. And, like, if they can just not get in their own way, the fact that Montreal is in a playoff spot tells you where this division is. Like, And I think if we're trying to figure out how many games Montreal need to lose so we get in, I think that's when... If this team is relying on that, that's when you get blown out in the first round. I think we have to just get our store in order and see what happens. We can't rely on Montreal losing or Vancouver losing or anything like that. We've just got to get our store in order and, like you were saying, win more than we're losing. I think we have to go 500 every week from here on out if we even want to want to try. Well, frankly, like with, they have 24 games left. At a minimum, they have to go 16-8. and eight. Yeah. You know, to be, like, not just in the playoffs, but enough where, like, you're not just squeaking in. And to be putting yourself in a good position to actually do something. You know, and that's fine. Like, that that's, it should be, especially in this division, that should be easily doable. Because looking at the teams, like, the only two that have legitimately high-end talent are Toronto and Edmonton. And even then, they have enough holes where they're beatable. It's just... So, like, you know, like the Flames should be able to walk over everybody else if they've got their stuff together. It's just... Which we know they don't. Yeah. Well, we've got 24 games left. Four of them are this week. Why don't we look ahead, as we always do, to what we think the Flames will do this week and how we can start to get close to those 16 that you say that we need for the 16-8 and eight record. Uh, last week, the Flames uh, split the week. Win-loss, win-loss, which is my prediction. So I'm up on Matt for nothing now. Matt keeps thinking they're going to win everything and is not doing well in this game. Well, you, you see, Dan, you're the problem. You know, you're oh, being a little too yeah. You're being a little too accurate. You see, you have to be more optimistic about this team. <laughs> Maybe the team should trade me if I'm the problem. Yeah, well, you see, you have to be more optimistic, and then the Flames will do better because they seem to mirror what you're saying. So you know, be more optimistic in your predictions. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll end up on a Florida Panthers podcast on next year if they trade me because I'm the problem. Yep. Um, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you what I was going to predict, and then I'll try what you were saying. I was going to go into this week saying the Flames were going to lose both to Ottawa and the second game to Winnipeg. The only one they would lose was on Friday. Um, so just to go through these these games for fans, Monday the 22nd, which is probably where you'll hear this uh, episode after the game, is a 5 p.m. start in, in uh, Ottawa. Wednesday the 24th is a special one to note for all the Calgary fans. A 3 p.m. start time. That's an early game. That reminds me of the bubble games when we were playing at like 1.30 p.m. And then we have Friday night, 8 p.m. start back here in Calgary. And Wednesday and uh, Saturday night, 8 p.m. start. Hockey night in Canada back here in Calgary. So I was going to say loss, loss, win, loss. But all right, Matt, I will go with four wins this week. Okay. There. And I was actually going to say a loss, loss win loss win so so you think yeah. that they will lose on monday night to ottawa you think they'll win the uh the early wednesday game then they'll lose the friday game and win the saturday hockey night canada game yeah okay so the opposite so, of what they did last week yeah all right they play the same days as last week monday wednesday friday saturday so maybe i'll be right yeah, well, it's one of those things that, like, this team, they need more what your second prediction will be, you know, and... <laughs> Alright, well, we'll find out if I'm the issue. I'm gonna go with four wins this week. I've locked it in, it's in a spreadsheet, it can't be changed. If it says on the internet, it must be true. So we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll go with that, and we'll see if they can pull out four wins this week. And, you know, honestly, if you do get this right with the four wins... Keep being optimistic. <laughs> All right. We're, we're, if your initial thought was accurate, then uh, I give up. <laughs> Twenty-four and zero from here on out, Matt. If I uh, if I get this one wrong, okay. or if I get this one right, twenty-four and zero. Okay. 
that works. <laughs> I'm going to note what my original prediction was just so we can see which one is right. Yeah. So my original prediction was loss, loss, win, loss, but I'm going to go with four wins. It's locked in. It's in a, a, a Google Doc, which we know we can't change once on the internet. It's locked in forever, so we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Yep. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's do the best we can to try and make some good happen this week, and um, hopefully, Flames fans, you can enjoy the hopeful resurgence because now that I've predicted four wins, we're going to see four, so enjoy all four of them this week. Exactly. Got to think on the bright side. You know, power of positivity. That's right. <laughs> and and when we're, we're positive, what are we going to say to our TVs, man? As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.